Good day and welcome to Unpacking the Hospital Digital Experience Index. My name is Jake Damari and I am the Director of Marketing at Connective DX. The Hospital Digital Experience Index is an annual report published by Connective DX and its purpose is to provide healthcare leaders with an objective and informed view they can use to baseline and improve how they engage with audiences online. Today, our healthcare practice lead, Dave Winicky, author and lead researcher of the report, will walk us through the key insights and takeaways uh, from this year's edition. Before I turn it over to Dave, I'd like to mention a few things. Uh, attendees are in listen-only mode, but we are quite interested in your questions, so please submit them anytime through the GoToWebinar Q&A interface, and we'll take a couple of breaks to answer them. Questions can also be asked via the chat function. Today's session is being recorded and all of you will receive a follow-up email with a link to the recording as well as a link to download the report in case you haven't already. But the report is also available right now in the handout section of the GoToWebinar interface. So once again, welcome and thanks for attending. And with that said, I'd like to turn it over to Dave Winicky. Hey Jake, thank you very much and hello everyone. Uh, this is, in fact, the uh, third of these reports that we've issued, and it's brand new. Uh, just less than two weeks ago, it was released. In the month running up to that, we shared copies with all of the organizations that are written about in it. Uh, we've met in person with about half of the organizations, and that's really one of the motivations of us uh, sharing public work. Uh, we do lots of this kind of analysis. Uh, in competitive situations and in client work, uh, but we like uh, engaging with people who are advancing uh, the art in healthcare marketing. And uh, also at this time of year, uh, to be able to share ideas that maybe uh, can be incorporated as uh, all of us look forward to 2019 uh, and do our strategic planning. Uh, the work that you're going to see today really started back in 1997 uh, as uh, Connective DX uh, got its uh, first work making complex websites. And uh, over the years, uh, our team of uh, current and former staff have done a great deal of work in healthcare with provider, payer, product, even public policy uh, players. And uh, what this work represents is normalizing some of uh, those discoveries and having a methodical way of doing analysis. So let me uh, tell you a little bit about where we're going to go today. Uh, if you have read the HDX15 report this year, you'll be seeing more than what's in the report. So this is not just uh, kind of a read-along uh, audio track for the report, uh, I'll be showing you a lot of things that wouldn't have been able to fit in the almost 80 pages of the report. We'll spend just a couple minutes talking about uh, the, uh, the what of the report, what's an HDX, how do you go about measuring digital strength, uh, but that's really not why we're here. Uh, my goal is to share with you not the what, but the so what. Uh, what are the six or seven things that seem really interesting in this report uh, that marketing professionals and technology visionaries uh, might be focusing on as they think about innovating uh, on behalf of their brands? Uh, the report itself is broken into four quads, and it's interesting that each quad, and this uh, is quite unintentional, seems to relate to a different profession that's involved in making digital experiences. So obviously, brand strength relates to brand management. Uh, functional capability, which will be our second focus, uh, has more of a tech and integration focus. Uh, use cases are throughout, uh, but we're going to have a provocative uh, thought to share with those of you uh, who are information architects. And market impact uh, often is where people who are content marketers focus. So my hope is to have uh, at least a theme for everyone and uh, hopefully open up more ideas uh, for discussion. And as Jake said, we we're both open to Q&A uh, here today on this call, uh, but the whole reason we go through this exercise of publishing a report is to inspire discussion. Uh, so hopefully uh, we open up more ideas uh, than we, we close or uh, make proclamations about. So what is the uh, HDX thing all about? In a nutshell, 
It's a way of quantifying digital strength. And as I talk to hospital uh, CEOs and presidents, uh, those are the native words that they use. How do you think about our digital strength? One way of doing that is by using a technique like the HDX, which is a baseline. And there are three things that baselining is useful for uh, in marketing. Uh, the first is to look across a set of competitors and have a structured way of looking at strengths and weaknesses and where uh, your experiences may lead or where there may be a gap in headroom for improvement. Second, and this is what we're doing today, is this also a methodical way to look for strong emerging work. So less looking at in-market competitors than looking at very strong players and seeing what their best new ideas are like early and even getting some level of uh, systematic evaluation around them. And that's really what the uh, HDX 15 report is, uh, which is the work that we are sharing today. Finally, you can use this on yourself over time as well to measure industry progress or your system's progress. And a great example of that would be uh, a system that's considering a whole change website redesign. And in the planning process, they may have a hypothesis of we want to improve certain parts of the experience. We know uh, a scoring rubric that shows us kind of what the direction of improvement would be. And then post-launch, you can actually measure uh, and see uh, both if uh, the experiences have improved, but also some of the, uh, the data that we look at, if that's improved too. So that's the why do this. The what do we use to do it is listed over on the right. And that includes uh, machine analysis, things like looking at reading level, uh, human analysis, because there's no substitute for putting real people on websites trying to get actual tasks done. Uh, sometimes that uh, frustration in the voice of the customer uh, really kind of uh, is a catalyst for us uh, as, as we try to elevate those points. We use some licensed data that allows us to externally look at market impact, traffic, time on site, things like that, and free data like looking at Google search result pages uh, and looking at search dominance and uh, knowledge boxes uh, that come up in the search experience. So that's the range of data that goes into this. And without uh, belaboring uh, what gets scored, uh, each of these quads have four to six or seven uh, different scored elements and there are probably as many things that we look at that we do not score uh, as that we score today. So an example of that is that in previous years, uh, we've uh, not scored uh, the use of multilingual content because there was very little of it. Uh, but because we had recorded that year after year, this year we saw that shift from one system to four systems, and we were able to incorporate that into our scoring model. And again, I'm not going to go through uh, scoring changes the way that the report does, uh, but what we found is that year over year, there's been little positional change between the hospitals that are returning uh, year over year. And uh, in the cases where there are changes, uh, they tend to be fairly uh, able to be attributed uh, to redesign or major uh, technical changes on site. So we don't think that there's a, a, a big reshuffle uh, between uh, what we've seen in previous years and this year. So consistency in that sense is probably good. Finally, and this is the last kind of how does it work, uh, who we look at matters. And in this case, we look at the top 15 ranked systems from US News and World Report. My thinking here uh, is that this is a well-known assortment uh, of systems that are really well thought of. And it's great that we're taking examples from well thought of clinically successful systems. But it's also a way that removes any new selection bias uh, that I or my colleagues would introduce by picking our favorite systems or picking systems that we have relationships with. So this essentially externalizes uh, the selection of our cohort uh, so that we're not uh, introducing a skew that would be hard to detect. We don't control the list, and uh, if you know the U.S. News list, you have thoughts about it very likely already. 
So that's the introduction to the HDX. Let's look at the first uh, quad in uh, the report. And we're probably going to spend the most time on brand clarity of the four today, and that's a little unusual. But we actually uh, have two very significant findings that I'd like to unpack with you. Uh, so first, over on the right, you can see the aggregate scores of brand clarity. And Northwestern Medicine over the years has just been playing this long game of improvement, not only in having a brand that moves from mobile to PC to billboard beautifully, uh, but language, imagery, uh, you know, particularly the mobile experience. So Northwestern really over time uh, has become a strong brand, but you see uh, how close the top five are clustered together. They're pretty much within 10%. And then there's a pretty fast drop off of brand clarity uh, as we go down that, uh, that curve. So the two findings I'd like to talk with you about today are brand activation and plain language. And uh, probably the top line finding for me is as we reviewed these websites, uh, we noticed that the number of women portrayed on the sites had significantly increased. And I'm going to go through all 15 sites and let you see what the raw data was that we saw. And though we never set out to measure who's on the website, it never occurred to us, we did have multiple years of images that we were able to go back and do analysis across. Uh, not only did the number of women double this year, uh, but the number of African Americans in hero images on these websites is more than four times what it was in the year prior. And you know that begs the question of why. So uh, we kind of went the extra mile and we spent time talking with brand leaders and uh, diversity leaders from some of the systems featured here. And I'll share some insights with you uh, about why uh, those people, uh, how those people explain this shift. So in 2017, last year, uh, most of the women on the, on the 15 top ranked websites uh, were patients either adult or girls. And you can see there's you know, quite an assortment here. There might be a bit of a pattern uh, that you'll see, uh, but most were patients. And in fact, there were only four uh, pictured uh, providers who were women. And uh, you can see a bit of a meme with the otoscope here. Uh, there's uh, the woman doctor who's next to the call us, refer a patient button. Uh, and you can pretty easily tell which of these four people is a chief of surgery. And uh, in the case of uh, Lisa Latanza, uh, she's uh, UPSF tends to put surgeons on their site more than others. She is the chief of hand and elbow and had just done a first in the world operation when we were looking at the site. And to some degree, uh, I feel that you know if you look at these professional images, uh, Dr. Latanza maybe is the direction of progress which this year got paid off, I think, in spades across uh, all of the 15 sites that we're going to take a quick look at today. Uh, you can see uh, not only uh, are there more professional uh, portrayals of women providers, uh, but there's also a level of diversity, which starts to uh, nod to the second factor that I mentioned, which there's clearly an intent on showing greater racial diversity across these 15 websites. So let me just give you a quick walkthrough, and you can have the same experience that our team had as we started to look at these sites. Now you'll see multiple images on many of these because they're rotating carousels. So there's not just one hero image, there are multiple hero images, and there are reasons why that is useful. Uh, but as you look at Barnes Jewish here, uh, it's interesting to note that not only is there a greater presence of women, uh, but there's a women and in infant center that's been launched. Uh, again, showing this isn't just uh, a facade of, hey, let's put some fresh images up, but there's a real focus on women as healthcare buyers, which is a bit of a small trend that you may see on some of these other sites. For instance, on Johns Hopkins, in the middle on the right, they also have a healthy woman center, and they're also doing life cycle marketing uh, towards women as uh, they both go through their life cycle and uh, participate in uh, creating families 
and uh, engaging in pediatric care. I would say that literally every image on the Hopkins site is demonstrating diversity from opening a new facility in the Middle East to the women's site to demonstrating how Hopkins is committed uh, to being intensely local to Baltimore, uh, even the position, uh, position next to the position finder. Uh, so it's, it's kind of hard to miss that signal. And now that you're sensitized to it, uh, you may just notice that signal making its way across literally the entire HDX 15. And as we saw this pattern accrue, you know, even at uh, MGH, uh, we recognize that you know, there's this trend, both of women and diversity, uh, that we wouldn't be able to think about the brands of the, how hospital brands have changed this year uh, without uh, talking about that. At Cleveland Clinic, there's just about a balance of men and women you'll see in the mobile app. There's diversity. I believe that's probably a woman on the left. You can judge that. Um, but there's a presence of these themes uh, across all of these sites. Uh, something interesting on Presbyterian is uh, they randomly load different people. And you can see, like in the American population, there's a slight skew towards women in uh, the population that we were able to count up. Uh, but also that these people are named. Unlike the uh, doctor you saw with the otoscope, uh, these are real people who are personifying uh, what being treated, deciding to be treated at New York Presbyterian is like. Uh, so you, know, you see that diversity over and over. Uh, Mayo has that same uh, gender balance and uh, signs of diversity, but it's really emphasized on their hiring site. And as we talked with people who are leaders, both in brand and in HR and diversity, one of the things we heard very clearly uh, is that organizations have become the stories that they tell, and to some degree, they become who they can hire. So in the case of uh, Mayo, which has lots of its uh, operations in Rochester, Minnesota, uh, it's important that its uh, recruiting site uh, shows the vibrancy and diversity of life, both in Rochester and engaging with the minds who are at Mayo. And uh, you know, it's both beautiful work, but you know, it just continues to accrue uh, that we see these messages. UCLA, again, shows a, a local focus like uh, Johns Hopkins. Uh, it also happened to be running uh, an inclusion focus as it was uh, starting a, a new LGBTQ uh, treatment uh, clinic uh, that it was uh, promoting uh, in April around Pride Month. So uh, again, this idea of inclusivity uh, is really very present as you look across uh, the great brands that are part of the HDX 15. Uh, Stanford, interestingly, showing both women, but I think the only one that portrays nursing in a hero image. University of Michigan, uh, again, you can kind of soak in uh, just the diversity of stories uh, being used to personify uh, who Michigan Medicine is. And University of Colorado. Uh, you'll see this theme of personalizing uh, throughout UC's work, and we're going to touch on that later. But you know, here's the woman mountain climber uh, who's a patient that they're tying uh, their initial brand experience to. And you can see again, uh, science forward at Penn Medicine and women and diversity, UCSF uh, very strongly uh, a woman focused experience landing on their site. So let me put you know, in context to you the question that I asked uh, marketing and diversity leaders, which was who circulated the design brief? All of these all of these sites changed. And to have twice as many women and four times as many African Americans, that's not a random event. And we were really impressed by this. And uh, like everything in life, there were a couple answers. One of which was there's this generalized need uh, for hospitals to become more diverse uh, as young medicine students enter, as patients enter. They're used to a level of diversity 
uh, which is more diverse than what the people running these fine institutions have experienced in their lives and would just off the bat experience as being diverse. So to some degree, and you'll see in the note on the side here, about a third of patients uh, come from minority populations, but the executive teams and the boards, by virtue of their generation, uh, are more homogenous. So there's this uh, attempt uh, to project, as leaders do, what these organizations must become in order to be successful in the future. Second, as we spend time with parents, uh, I'm sorry, patient and family advisory committees, uh, we hear a community desire uh, for hospitals to be part of not just creating health in the community, but healthy culture. And often that uh, has encouraged systems uh, as they look at the social determinants of health to have a posture that is a bit more interventionist uh, in supporting social change uh, that may be to the good of the communities that they're so invested in. So to my knowledge, I think that my colleagues and I, we may be alone in measuring this external sign of what we believe are greater changes that are going on inside of these organizations. And uh, you know, that may continue or not in a linear fashion, but we are certain to be paying uh, continued attention uh, to the way that inclusion shows itself on brands. And one of the way that's taking place is also through multilingual publishing. And as I alluded to earlier, uh, over the last several years, there's really only been one site that's been universally translated. That was Brigham and Women's uh, two years ago. But this year, uh, we have four sites uh, that are translating. And we'll spend some time looking at Mayo, which is shown here. Uh, Mayo uses a, a hybrid approach uh, of custom written content which you see pictured, uh, but also translated site-wide. While University of Colorado, Cedar sinai UCLA uh, are primarily translated and they're uh, the new players in the HDX 15. So that's a pretty huge change of going from one uh, to four. The other thing I uh, would be negligent not to note in passing is that across all of these sites, reading level has improved. And by that, I mean it's become easier to read these sites. Uh, on average, these 15 sites have actually become one full grade level easier to read this year. Uh, for every six sites, uh, from actually for every one site that became harder to read, six sites became easier. So there is this trend of rewriting. And just as multilingual uh, publishing makes healthcare content uh, more accessible. Uh, so does writing uh, in sim simpler language. So I had mentioned that Mayo has a hybrid approach. You'll see on the left that there's custom written content like Grand Rounds in Spanish, but there's also translated content. They have a huge amount of uh, health publishing and uh, medicine publishing that they've done and that's uh, available uh, in uh, a translated form. Uh, so they're taking a, a hybrid approach and across all of these sites, the concept of becoming multilingual isn't something that happens as a forklift upgrade. Uh, it's a long process, uh, which uh, like the other trend I just mentioned, may or may not uh, continue in a linear fashion but we do see this popping up across other sites than the four that have done site-wide translation. So again, here's New York Presbyterian. Uh, their portal page for onboarding uh, users to their patient portal uh, has language localization. Uh, there are materials for how you get ready to come to the hospital, stay there, have a baby, uh, what happens after care uh, are universally translated for each of their facilities in Spanish. Uh, so we see growth uh, in point solutions as well as site efforts. Uh, I'll also just point out something I thought was ingenious, and this is UCSF again. Uh, they have language translated maps, and all of the building names, of course, are in English, uh, but the directions of getting to them are in native language. So this hybrid approach would allow someone who's navigating on campus uh, to hold this map up to someone else who would recognize the English names of the building and uh, to help them on their way. So both 
multilingual is a, I think, sea change uh, compared to other years. Uh, but also this idea of uh, inclusivity and local relationship being a more uniform part of how uh, hospitals are expressing who they are uh, really were uh, two noteworthy findings that we had this year. So I'm going to take a break. I am hoping by now that uh, the experts who are on the phone uh, may have a question or two, and I'd love to hear uh, what people are thinking. Yeah, absolutely, Dave. One question. Um is looking at the 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 sites that you've shared it looks like there are some possibly some rotating carousels as far as hero images are concerned i'm wondering uh are, are the question is are they kind of a um you know, out of favor now uh, that's that's a great question from time to time i get this question which is sort of we have a carousel is that kind of a guilty pleasure uh <laughs> has the world passed us by and uh, in truth, about half of the HDX15s have these. And I think that they exist this way uh, because they uh, fulfill a really important function, and that is to let marketers split the difference in what they're promoting in their uh, top positions. So there may be some service line things, there may be some brand things, uh, there may be a temporal announcement, and rather than having uh, to pick you know, who your favorite child is, uh, the carousel is allowing uh, the people who run websites uh, to do their job in a way uh, that accommodates multiple stakeholders. So uh, yes, uh, the very top ranked brand experiences are not using carousels, and that's not something we grade on, uh, but a lot of these systems are and I think that they're doing it for what was probably a rational and valuable reason. Great, great. And the second question is, how are you measuring um, the reading level across these sites? Oh, okay. Uh, for the content marketers there, uh, we use the Gunning Fox scale, and we apply it to a uniform set of pages that all major systems have. So things like the conditions page, and the condition page is usually a bugbear because there are a lot of complex words on that page. Uh, home page, contact us, uh, individual pages like that uh, get sampled uh, and then averaged together. And uh, Gunning Fox is the score. Uh, in previous editions, I've actually put the links out of which tool we use, and I'm glad to share that uh, with anyone who, uh, who tweets us after uh, the event. Excellent, thank you. Great. If that's good, let's uh, continue to the second quadrant, and that will probably get a little bit less of a deep dive. Uh, but I want to uh, pay attention first uh, to the significant change that's happened over the last several years, and that is that virtually all of the HDX15 uh, rank sites have become mobile first using responsive design. And that's uh, a multi-year effort. Uh, as, uh, as sites have done this, we've seen them jump up uh, in the standings uh, versus those who have not. That's one of the changes that seems to uh, reorder uh, our ranks, not that that's why we do this. Uh, one of the things that we see as we look across all traffic to these 15 sites uh, is there is now a significant majority of mobile visits. And while 58% against 42% uh, is a pretty dramatic split. Uh, the system that we can see with the highest percent of mobile visits is getting near 80% of visits mobile. So this suggests to me that while many have arrived uh, in, in this mobile translation and are now dealing with mobile traffic, your mobile traffic may continue to shift. And the idea that you're thinking about your digital experiences on a mobile-first basis likely makes a great deal of sense. And that frames the other things that we're going to talk about in the functionality category, uh, being uh, telehealth, uh, a little bit of doctor finding, uh, and the use of the telephone. So uh, telehealth is really this infrastructure that is going to have, like a lot of other things, multi-years of impact. And it's going to be different depending on how systems decide to use uh, the infrastructure. So by that I mean, 
some systems may be able to do cost containment by diverting emergency room visits uh, to digital visits. Others may use surge expertise, so during areas of peak need or during crisis, they can use telemedicine expertise brought into their online facilities uh, to augment on-site uh, clinical expertise. And uh, finally, around convenience, uh, we'll see examples uh, where simply the patient experience is better if it can be done conveniently anywhere uh, on the planet. Uh, Barnes, uh, I want to feature as uh, you know someone who's really invested themselves over over years. Uh, is both doing uh, ICU telemedicine uh, for themselves, uh, but they're also serving other hospitals. And they've opened up uh, the stroke network, which is pictured down a, at the bottom right of this, uh, as a service that they extend uh, to other organizations that want to uh, leverage their uh, expertise remotely. Uh, likewise, we've mentioned uh, women's centers and uh, the focus on uh, women as uh, purchasers of care, uh, Barnes incorporates uh, telemedicine as one of the ways uh, to make fertility treatment less demanding and uh, uh, a better experience uh, for women engaged in that. Uh, so you can see uh, Barnes using this infrastructure in a variety of ways, both to their patients uh, but also to extend their expertise to other organizations. I wanted to also, as we talked about uh, telemedicine, focus on two leaders who are really commercializing this and making telemedicine uh, a more routine part of care. Uh, Cleveland Clinic has probably had the most visible long-term commitment uh, to building telemedicine. If you look at their homepage over years, uh, conservatively, a quarter of their page has been dedicated to rolling out uh, telemedicine and remote second opinion uh, services as part of their online offerings. And they've just had this structural commitment uh, that they've made evident through their website, uh, which is part of obviously how their leadership is thinking uh, about bringing their uh, clinical services to a wider market. Uh, likewise, uh, the graphic on the right uh, is from New York Presbyterian again, and uh, they're simplifying this idea uh, that you can have uh, expertise in your home. I think they also do an allergist in your living room as one of their campaigns. Uh, so these are uh, examples both of uh, how brands are normalizing telemedicine, uh, but I believe that it's an example of uh, what happens when there's more and more ubiquitous mobile experiences that are connecting patients to care. So mobile isn't just a way of initially engaging patients. Uh, in some cases, it's going to be uh, a means of engaging them all the way uh, through treatment. So next I'd like to uh, point out something that was a surprise. And I hope that this has as much impact to you as me. Uh, among these uh, prestigious 15 systems, two of them outright on their websites elevate the phone number and they say, if you want the fastest assistance, if you want the best way to contact us, we want you to use the phone. And what's important to me about this is it recognizes that uh, digital self-service, though valuable, is not necessarily the best way of engaging on every journey to care. And that sometimes moving from a digital self-service experience to a caring human on the phone is in fact a digital finish line. And the fact that these two organizations are using the word fastest and best uh, is a signal, I believe, to other systems that subordinate their phone number and uh, promote that less as part of the uh, buying experience. Uh, and uh, to some degree, uh, this is a signal, uh, I believe, that an important part of digital marketing is the finish line represented by the, phone, by the phone number, and that the phone number and the form should never be enemies, uh, that these are all tools uh, in effective uh, selling and service 
experiences. To that end, uh, one of the other things that I suppose was a surprise is uh, Cedar Sinai uh, has a downright attractive contact us form. And this is important because a lot of times digital teams, they focus their UX expertise or their creative expertise on areas where there are service line budget holders uh, that demand services and they want to see lift. And uh, the contact us page, much like uh, Doctor Finders, is a, paint, is a patient access uh, universal touch point. Uh, it's a, a common touch point that goes across uh, many journeys, both to care, but as you can see here, to getting uh, billing and financial assistance information, uh, or uh, even locating a patient if you're a visitor. Uh, so for us, uh, this uh, example from Cedar sinai was an important wake up that the contact us form is really a key point uh, of conversion on many of the sites that we look at, and many of the sites that we look at are not uh, showing the thoughtful approach uh, that's happened here from Cedars. Uh, so as you're thinking about uh, low-hanging fruit next year, uh, the Contact Us page on many uh, great hospital websites uh, is a place that uh, it's not sexy, uh, but it's a place where researchers become buyers or where customers become frustrated trying to find the right resource. So finally, in this uh, functionality phase, I wanted to touch on doctor finders. And if you've read the report, uh, we have a couple pages that kind of asks, uh, kind of a, a biting the hand that feeds us kind of question, which is, isn't it time to make doctor finders more useful? And this question actually came uh, to me uh, at HIMSS. I was listening to Preston Gee from Christus uh, talk about primary research that he had shared uh, about what patients actually need when they're making a doctor finding decision. And over here on the left uh, were the top three things uh, that, that Mr. Gee talked about. And that the first, which was a prerequisite for everything else, was insurance coverage. Can, can my insurance benefit me um, with the treatment that I get? And as I looked across the HDX 15 hospitals, only three of the 15, that's only 20% of them, are able to allow people like Barnes does, pictured here, to search by insurance plan. And that kind of took me back that if the primary screen for patients is only being uh, directly served 20% of the time by even very good systems. What on earth are we doing? Because many of these websites, and broader than the 15 of them pictured here, make that the very first link and tend to position that as a really critical part of the patient journey. So serving what patients actually need to know, will my insurance work? Are there convenient locations and searching based on my uh, location and the uh, things that evidence that will be treated with care uh, really are uh, touch points. So just in passing, and this um, is actually pretty much also shown in the guide, I wanted to illustrate a few ways that great brands are doing this. Uh, inside of Cleveland, uh, you'll see uh, an ever-growing amount of video engagement, which so well serves patients who may be trying to read meaning into places where no one thought there would be meaning. What medical school did they go to? Uh, how many years have they been in the profession? Uh, those have meaning indications as we've spent time with patients uh, making doctor decisions, which aren't just rational math. Uh, they're stand-ins for social distance, for approachability. Uh, so video is a very rich canvas. Uh, those of you who are focused on SEO know that video results are extremely valuable and almost in jest. I hear a lot of talk about how do we divert uh, from billboards that may not be uh, as productive uh, for patient access uh, to digital. The one answer may be getting people promoting their ideas and uh, their community presence by video 
uh, may be engaging to doctors in a way that's similar to billboards. Uh, but it's a great brand canvas, and we see Cleveland uh, making a year-after-year -year, uh, investment in that. University of Colorado does something that a lot of healthcare brands, particularly in this group, uh, do not do, and that is really open up their brand standard with how doctors uh, show their humanity and uh, their personal side. Uh, not everyone on the UC website has a cowboy hat, uh, but approachability is a very important part of that brand. Uh, the other thing that you'll find on their site is that their doctor profiles are uh, composites uh, that include lots of links back to the service lines and locations where these people work, and that they bring in content that's federated from trials, it says um, trails, uh, trials and research. Uh, so if uh, someone is publishing research, that's being brought in uh, from their uh, CV uh, into uh, the doctor portal. Uh, one thing that occurs to me that's interesting, oh, you also see that they're doing uh, podcasting, which further personifies the brand. One of the things that's interesting to me is that I don't believe I've seen anyone make doctor profiles different for referring providers than patients. And obviously, professionals shopping for a professional referral would probably have different needs. So uh, the idea of really rethinking uh, who we serve and how well we serve them with these important and very invested in uh, technologies uh, seems like it's something that's due uh, for investment. And uh, finally, I want to give a hat tip to Cedar sinai once again. Uh, they, I believe, are the only uh, doctor finder I've seen that uh, takes a lesson from e-commerce and allows you to do side-by-side -side comparison of doctors, uh, at least in the 15 that we're looking at. Uh, that's the kind of thing that you might find on a Best Buy site. And uh, while I'm not sure uh, that comparing a BU grad to a Johns Hopkins grad is necessarily a meaningful data, uh, knowing who speaks uh, French or Urdu uh, versus Chinese and English uh, might be extremely important. Uh, so that kind of uh, pick a few doctors and then export the ones that we like per selection uh, showed a level of kind of innovative thinking that conceivably um, across uh, many of these best sites we might be due for. So that's a little bit about uh, doctor finders. So I will uh, once again take a breath there and uh, look back to you, Jake, uh, for uh, any questions. And let's just take one. Yeah, absolutely. So um, looking at the, the most interesting questions come in for this section, um, our physician finder is one of the most sophisticated and contentious parts of our site. Uh, why, of all things, um, should it need attention? Here's the theory. Um, it really is important. And our MDs and our clinical staff beyond them really personify the expertise of the hospital. But I believe that a lot of physician finders say the things that doctors say to each other or would wish to say to the public, I am not sure that a lot of the physician finding experience has started with the patient experience and what they need to make um, a satisfying and informed decision of care. Uh, so this really is an opportunity, uh, you know, I think to take the good work that's been done and look at what it, how we can disrupt ourselves to be radically good. So thank you for that question. The next two sections really have one point each that I want to share. Um, our use cases have expanded this year, uh, but for those of you who are focused on usability and site architecture, I wanted to highlight what might be an emerging standard. And that is, uh, you can see in the bottom left, uh, an excerpt from the MGH page, where there really are uh, these tabs that separate, uh, get started, does separate the new patients from the existing patients. Oh, and there also are referring providers. MGH highly values international traffic. That gets their own experience, but new existing referring. And MGH has been doing this kind of architectural experience split for a while. Now, this is our first year looking at University of Colorado in our cohort. 
and you can see the exact same lineup. New patients, existing patients, referring providers. Why does it happen this way? Well, uh, existing patients are tracked uh, to a, a My uh, Colorado, a My Epic portal, uh, while new patients need to get a richer brand experience and referring providers have specialized services for them. So MGH does this, Colorado does this, Stanford does this. They did it a little bit of a different way, uh, but they say talk directly with your clinic or doctor. And if you click the link, it takes you to sign on to the portal. Uh, if you're new, you can find out why choose Stanford Health or uh, how do you become a patient. And it's a step-by-step. -step. How do you become uh, a customer of Stanford? And uh, it's interesting to see that broken down. That allows Stanford to provide two different finish lines. One is sign on to the portal. And signing on to the portal and booking a, a, an appointment, those of you in analytics need to be thinking about how you mark that as a digital win. Because that is a digital win as surely as a new patient going through the new patient experience and becoming a patient. And here Stanford provides a much richer experience explaining why Stanford Healthcare is a great place to be a new patient at. Uh, even Barnes Jewish, when you look at their uh, doctor profiles, have separate phone numbers tracking returning patients versus new patients that need to be established as accounts in a different way. So I hold that up to those of you who are information architects. Uh, as something that's uh, an important uh, experience split. And I will uh, step forward actually to uh, our final area before we do question and answer, and that's around market impact. Uh, you can see here some famous brands, Mayo and Cleveland, not a surprise. Uh, Mayo, in fact, having 100% market impact. You'll see why that is in a moment. Uh, but really across hospitals, you can see how important organic traffic is uh, to being successful. Uh, the paid media uh, going to these 15 sites is under 1%. And organic uh, is about 60%, with people returning or following a direct link being 35%. So organic really is the game. And as you look across the 15, there are two that are huge. And Mayo is the hugest by far and Cleveland is the hugest by next. The two of these account for 80% of the visits that come to all 15 of these hospitals. It's a very high skew. If you look at the two smallest ones, their traffic is 130 times less than the two biggest ones. So as publishers, Mayo Clinic and Cleveland are operationally doing things that are very different uh, than prestigious hospitals who are very successful, uh, but aren't playing uh, content marketing uh, uh, in, in the very strong and innovative way that these brands are. Uh, what we would suggest as we look uh, across these brands and as we talk with them, that uh, previously we had used measures like time on site or page depth, uh, but increasingly uh, we find that non-branded search arriving is the sign that a digital team is doing a great job. If you work for a super famous hospital, uh, having branded search show up is part of being super famous. But having people showing up searching on the names of doctors, the names of conditions, uh, treatments, protocol names, those are areas where digital teams can really uh, grab new demand which isn't structurally already defined by a brand. Uh, so as we work with uh, systems working in this space, uh, the non-branded search uh, for us is becoming a, a key metric. And uh, you can see, well, Mayo and Cleveland is quite strong at this. Hopkins in Michigan, a uh, very uh, intensely academic uh, clinical programs, uh, both stand out on top. And uh, I think that as we continue to talk to programs, we'll want to understand a little bit better uh, about how it is that uh, they're succeeding that way or why that appears in their search data. Uh, but I think the takeaway is as we think about what the key metric is for digital teams, 
uh, non-branded search is increasingly that. So if you have this report, at the end there are some kind of final rankings and write-ups. And I'm not going to go through these in detail, but what's interesting to me is they break out by deciles. Uh, that there are two uh, in the 80s, there are two in the 70s, there are two in the 60s, and virtually everyone else is confined around the 50s. So there really is that familiar curve. And as you read through these findings, uh, you can start to get a feel uh, for what uh, the style of these different leaders are. Uh, so I would recommend uh, the report to you if you want to kind of go into the standings or the rankings. But I think most important to us as we look at next year's planning uh, are the key trends that are uh, changing healthcare. Uh, in closing, before Q&A, uh, we do share uh, kind of our view of these 15 systems, but we do a great deal uh, of custom work, uh, doing benchmarking in the ways that I described, uh, helping teams uh, do custom insight to gain insight on particular types of site visitors, improving journeys to care, and uh, helping people think about product and experience design. So that's the type of thing uh, that we're using this type of thoughtful approach on on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but we're also really pleased to talk with you as you find just great examples of this kind of art moving forward. We'd love to generate conversation and uh, we're really pleased the way that uh, these systems and others uh, have added to the conversation and, and helped to uh, make us a part of that. So uh, I want to you know, both thank you for joining us today, uh, but also look back to Jake and uh, throw things open to finish with some Q&A. Yeah, thanks, Dave. We've got a few more great questions in here. Um, let's see, one is, our hospital made it through the pivot to mobile. Are there other disruptive changes on the horizon that could cause a multi-year disruption uh, as that did? That's, that's a, a great question. I once had uh, a publishing leader whose name you might recognize ask, why is digital transition taking so damn long in our industry? And uh, the good news is the change that people have invested in in uh, being mobile first really has done a lot to atomize content, to leverage taxonomies, to separate content and display in ways that are making what used to be static websites much more agile. That said, uh, as I talk to uh, the digital leaders in this report, uh, people are thinking a lot about the use of tagging and taxonomy to get their content ready for voice search. Uh, so voice is one of those areas uh, that's driving some technical rework and will likely be a multi-year journey but mm. perhaps not as disruptive as mobile, the mobile wave finally was. Um, I'd also bring up multilingual again, uh, that multilingual doesn't happen in a step, but we're beginning to see a shift among these leaders. And if you're in a region uh, where a multilingual brand is important, not only uh, may you want to think about what initial steps and forays you want to start for building that capability, but then to track that back to voice search because the voices that would be searching in your region aren't necessarily searching in English and that will be part of your brand if uh, you're looking to serve people in language and not just do that as part of uh, your requirements, but to do that as part of your brand, those two trends are going to intersect very likely in the next year or two. And while they may not happen at the scale of mobile, uh, they're going to take a level of architectural thinking and testing and experimenting uh, that may be more creative than what mobile uh, started out as. That's interesting. I just made a connection there. Perhaps one of the reasons why we're seeing this sort of shift towards uh, simplification of content amongst these 15 leaders is a result of um, both the need to drive multilingual content and the need to um, to support mobile, I'm sorry, to support voice search in the future. Um, yeah, absolutely a focus. What else? Let's see. Uh, 
what best practices for engaging referring providers would you recommend? Okay, that's a, a question that wasn't one of the trends that we pulled up here, uh, but I'm going to comment that as I work with health systems, referring provider is almost always the area where additional work has the straightest line uh, to revenue improvement. Uh, as I think across the great sites that we saw this year, the two that I would call out, and in fact, I think we do in the report, is UPMC and Cleveland Clinic. Uh, there are two things you can find on UPMC that are just fantastic. First, over and over, I find that this brand is the great uh, this intermediator or uh, explainer. When do you go to the emergency room? Uh, when do you go to urgent care? When do you use telemedicine? UPMC is great about that. For referring provider, they're also great at providing physician resources uh, that include their CME programs uh, using video learning. So they're really like a lot of uh, influence organizations beyond healthcare. They're using education as a way of raising their brand and creating uh, more connective relationships. The other one I'd give a shout out to is take a look at Cleveland Clinic and Consult QD, uh, which is a content hub uh, that focuses on areas of specialized practice, and it shows things that practitioners in those areas of specialty would want to know about what people at Cleveland Clinic are interested in. And this really the uh, first and best uh, content hub that I've seen in referring provider. And if you're looking for a way where you could really uh, pull out some stops, uh, those two examples uh, aren't little incremental pieces of progress, but they're uh, re real investments and commitments. Excellent. Um, let's see, next question is, I recall the HDX scoring for traveling patients. Why did you uh, stop? Uh, honestly, uh, we are so privileged to get to talk with uh, systems and sometimes they care about what the number ends up being on them. Uh, some hospitals really love traveling patients and we've done research on why traveling patients go one place versus another, you know, to help them. But a lot of great hospitals aren't that focused on traveling patient. So we turned that into something which is a non-scored item. Uh, so we didn't penalize great websites and great systems just because their business doesn't key on that as much as others. Uh, it's an area that we continue to observe. Maybe we should do a blog post about it. Uh, we simply don't score it anymore uh, because some of the systems pointed out that that was not really a measure of digital strength, uh, but of them doing something we thought was interesting. So we changed that uh, based on feedback. Okay. And uh, last question, similar to the to that one, is I remember this report using time on site and pages per visit as an engagement metric. Uh, why phase that out? Well, it's an eternal uh, argument. If greater time is good or bad, and if greater pages is good or bad, in previous years it was clearer that we could correlate that to other positive measures. But here's what's happening. We talked about uh, there being essentially two finish lines in those new information architectures that uh, Chicago, I'm sorry, that uh, Colorado and uh, that MGH are using. Uh, once someone exits uh, a main website to a portal, that looks like a real short visit, and it's not. And as meaningful use drives that behavior more and more, we know that's going to confound the way we externally can look and see that data. Uh, so rather than waiting for it to become meaningless, uh, we decided that it made sense to exit the eternal debate of time on site since we know we're measuring it uh, less and less accurately because of portal use. And uh, that's one of the things that helped us focus in uh, on non-branded uh, search as a, a key metric. And uh, that's something that you know we would love to discuss uh, with people who are interested in measuring success uh, like these brands.
Excellent. Well, Dave, thanks again. And uh, thank, thank you to everyone else who took the time to join us this morning. Um, once again, we will uh, send out an email with a link to the recording of this uh, webinar and um, also the report. Um, so have a great rest of the day. Thanks, everyone.